right now. <laughs> Boy, you got that right. It's going to be a great week. Everybody is still a dwelling on last night and probably won't stop until the kickoff against the Redskins next week. Football is the ultimate team game. No other sport has more players on its roster, all who must perform their roles individually so that the group can succeed as a whole. Last night, the Saints again had to turn to some of their lesser lights to fill in for their stars. Guys like Jamal Jones, Mike Carney, and Rodney Leslie did so admirably, all contributing to a 42 to 17 thrashing of the Dallas Cowboys. It's hard to get through a season completely healthy and so I think that when you carry a 53 roster I think the guys understand they need to understand that at some point it might be their number and, and I you know you don't know when it's going to happen you just have to as a player practice and prepare like each weekend that that might be the time. Tulane's search for its new head football coach has ended. Juan Kincaid joins us live from Uptown with the new man who's hardly new to coaching, right Juan? That's exactly right, Jim. We're outside the Wilson Center here on Tulane's campus. At the bottom of the hour, Tulane will introduce their next head football coach, Bob Toledo, coached for 30 years and throughout uh, many universities. He spent seven years as the head coach of UCLA, which is one of the places he had the majority of his success there. He's a 60-year-old guy. Some say he may be too old for the job, but he is the guy for the job here at Tulane. Again, 30 years experience on the collegiate level. Most of his experience as and successful experience coming at UCLA it took him to four bowl games while he was there. We first told you about Tulane uh, Toledo's name surfacing on Saturday when he interviewed with Rick Dixon, the athletic director. Then, of course, he has named the head coach today of Tulane. He becomes their 37th head coach in the school's football history. We'll hear from Toledo coming up on iNews and a special fourth down on four coming up at 6:30. Jim, Juan, we'll rejoin you then. In the course of an NFL season, certain games at certain times get certain labels. Must game, trap game, sandwich game. Last night's, as far as the Saints were concerned, got this one, step up game. Against the best team playing the best football that the Saints had faced all year, that would be a difficult test. Given how many integral Saints players were hurt or missing from action, it was in the minds of many an improbable or impossible challenge against a Cowboy team that listed not one player on its injury report. So who would step up? Certainly it didn't figure to be Jamal Jones, who had never scored an NFL touchdown in his career, getting his first one. It would be even more unlikely that it would be Mike Carney, who had never scored an NFL touchdown as well. Mike Carney scoring his first. Mike Carney scoring his second. Mm -hmm. Mike Vick, or Carney, changing hands in midair to knock the pylon off its mooring, a la Mike Vick, while scoring his third touchdown of the game. What was likely was that Drew Brees would step up in a game that was already near the top rung of his personal ladder. Three weeks ago, after the Saints had dropped their second in a row and he had thrown a pair of interceptions in the Bengal end zone, Brees called himself out. I have to stop throwing interceptions and we have to stop turning the ball over. He hasn't thrown a pick since. The Saints haven't turned the ball over since. In three games, they haven't lost since. And after the winning streak was stretched to three last night, after the only cheers in Texas Stadium still echoing were those of deuce, deuce in vast stretches of stands, vacant but for the fans of the visitors, those fans gathered above the exit where the Saints would make their way to their locker room. There they held their arms outstretched, begging for wristbands, visors, and hats, flung to them in, intoxic in the intoxicating glow of victory like beads and baubles to a Mardi Gras tourist. The Saints fans were the tourists in Texas Stadium, but in the end, they had taken it over as their own, as the Saints had overtaken the Cowboys. Many of the pregame questions had been answered along the way, but one remains. After all this city has been through, after all those fans have been through, after all the Saints had been through, after all it, they and us have endured, one question remains for the future to answer for them, for us, and for everyone. Is this a team of destiny. And that's Look at Sports. Feels Great. like it. Let's hope so. Don't forget, fourth down coming up, 6.30, iNews on the yes. internet and live right here on Channel 4. Email your questions or give us a call as well. Absolutely. Catch what's coming up next on fourth down. The Saints make a statement in prime time and now have everyone in the NFL on notice. When you go on the road like that and you play a good team, it's always good to get a win. We'll hear from the head coach and answer your questions on this special iNews edition of Fourth Down. This is the last word on sports. Fourth Down on Four. And push in the slot. 
The only running back is Carney. He gets the call, yes. and he walks in. Breeze, play action. Going to throw it. It's caught by Carney. <laughs> Mike Carney again. <laughs> Throwing down the seam. Caught by Jones. Makes a tackle. Touchdown. 40, 35, 30. They can't be stopped. 25, 15, 5. Reggie Bush. Reggie, Reggie. Steps up. Throws down the near sideline for Henderson. Loopy grab at the 10. Falls at the Get 4. In. Rolls to the goal line. Touchdown, Saints! And what a night it was. The rest of the nation is now taking notice of our New Orleans Saints. Hello and welcome to a special fourth down edition of iNews. Before last night's complete domination of the Dallas Cowboys, the Saints had their detractors. But after winning in the fashion they did, Sean Payton's club has now emerged as a legitimate Super Bowl contender. Positioning themselves for a division title, a home game in the playoffs, and right now, the number two seed in the NFC. We'll be taking your phone calls and emails later in the show. We'll also head out to the Tulane campus where the Green Wave are about to introduce their new head football coach, Bob Toledo. But first, Sean Payton was mostly smiles and a few yawns in his Monday morning press conference. After a, night plane, a late night plane ride home, the coach will trade a lack of sleep for more wins like the one in Texas Stadium Sunday night. Juan Kincaid has more from Saints camp. Would the real Mike Carney please stand up? Mr. Hattrick, that was, that was awesome. The Saints' newfound touchdown maker was all the talk at Saints camp today. We're happy enough after the first one. And then obviously the second one, and we're man, thinking, yeah. man, this is great. And then the third one, it was just like, all right, this is, this is just one of those crazy nights. Oh, he'll be lo lobbying for more touches here in the future. Not even. My job, my, I know what my job is here. I know what my role is. And uh, it's, it, I'm just an extra offensive lineman back there doing the, doing the knit and grit. For Deuce and Reggie, and for Drew, and um, you know, but when your number's called, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta answer. No one complained about the role Carney played Sunday night, but you could tell by his touchdown celebrations that the end zone felt more like the twilight zone. I didn't know what to do. Um, the second time, I decided to spike it, and the spike was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to work on that, but uh, you know, you never know when you're going to go back in that end zone again, especially in my position. So you just got to relish and enjoy it and have fun with it. And that's what I did. Didn't quite get the lift that we were looking for, <laughs> but uh, so it won't make the spike uh, real, you know, but uh, hey, it, 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 at that point, who cares? A 42 to 17 Saints win in Texas Stadium. One of, if not the most impressive wins in Saints history. The players feel like they finally silenced some of their many critics. Last time I checked, they said we had one of the toughest schedules, you know, in the NFL. It just so happens that as we get now to the end, to towards the end of the year, uh, a lot of teams uh, on our side have been, you know, pretty much beating up one another. So, I mean, each week, uh, I mean, the challenge is still in front of us. So, I mean, we have to really just take them one at a time. Yeah, I'm sure that uh, there's always the doubters. So far, everything Sean Payton has touched has ended up being a positive for the black and gold. He says he understands why Saints fans cannot stop talking about the playoffs, but Payton says he refuses to get caught up in that. There aren't any playoff feelings. I mean, we, we have we have a chance to to do something this weekend and 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 then begin to you know look at the picture. I mean, I, I think at this point with three games left in the season, uh, you know, everyone begins to look at all the scenarios that, that can take place. But I just think that, you know, what we've been able to do really, and, and, I, and not just give lip service to this, but what we've been able to do is really look at and work on the team we're playing that week. And, and this week it's Washington. From Saints camp, I'm Juan Kincaid, fourth down on four. All of those Saints fans and players who are complaining about the lack of national respect now have it. Here's a look at what some of the uh, columnists are saying around the country after the victory over Dallas. Here's what ESPN.com columnist and McDonough 35 graduate Michael Smith wrote. A 42-17 blowout on national television of the Dallas Cowboys, winners of four straight in five of their previous six, and a popular choice as the NFC's best team makes New Orleans a certified championship contender. Not just a feel-good story, but a really good team. Tim Kolashaw of the Dallas Morning News wrote, the one thing we learned for sure is that the aspirations for a title in New Orleans, something that has eluded the Saints for their first 39 years, are quite real. And this in from a former Saints critic from Pro Football Weekly. 
Having spent the last 14 weeks basically dismissing them, I am now here to tell you that the Saints are not only going to be in the playoffs, but they'll be the one club none of the NFC's big boys will want to face. Not only the writers are beginning to believe, but the Saints' opponents are seeing what New Orleans fans already knew. I mean, they're a great, I mean, they're a good team. Um, obviously, they utilized uh, Bush, and, you know, to the best of his ability, and uh, he made some plays, and, you know, um, they, they made more plays than we did. Well, we took a bad beat tonight. Uh, we got beat really pretty much every way possible, and uh, they really outplayed us. Kept us off balance, did a real good job. We didn't play well. And uh, we've got to get back to work here and regroup and see what we can do the rest of the way. But that was a, a pretty good licking. And uh, I can't think of anything that uh, we really did very well. We felt good going into this game. You know, I, I really felt as a team that, you know, we could come in here and make a, uh, make a game of this. You know, we're not going to get down by any means. Obviously, it's a letdown to, to come in our, in our place and, and stink it up like we did. Still ahead on this iNews edition of Fourth Down, the game was played in Texas Stadium. But thanks to the black and gold fans, it sounded a lot more like the Superdome. We'll have more on their impact in Dallas. Plus, Tulane names their new head coach. Lost friends, loved ones, and football games to Texas down through the years. Last night was their night as much as it was the Saints. In the final minutes of last night's one-sided demolition of the Cowboys in Dallas, there was a mixture of cheers and boos. Cheers from Saints fans, <laughs> boos from those of the Cowboys. At the end, there were more Saints fans in the stands than those of the Cowboys. America's team was taking a distant back seat to America's underdog. We have a lot of people rooting for us. The synergy between the Saints and their fans just keeps increasing with each win. More and more, each is understanding what they mean to the other. I think we have something special going on here and, you know, just can continue to build on it every week. The Saints seem to be playing with more confidence and aggressiveness with each passing game. No one more so than the often maligned secondary, which has picked off five passes in the last two wins. And the fans who traveled to Dallas last night contributed to that mindset. All the way from Dallas, I mean, our fans was, you know, they, they showed up in Dallas in great numbers. And, and when we got back home, I mean, they was out there at the airport in, in great numbers as well. So, I mean, it feels good anytime you could get a win and you uh, get back home very late and to see as many fans that we had out there just to support us and uh, uh, give us a nice applause. It was nice. At the end of the game, the Saints fans were able to abandon the hinterlands of Texas Stadium for the premium seats, long since abandoned by the Cowboy fans who began heading for home in the third quarter. Our fans make their way down to about the first 20 rows around the entire stadium, and it's just chanting, you know, who dat and Saints and, and all those things, and it's just, I mean, it was awesome to see the type of support that we got from fans coming over from Louisiana, and we probably have some fans in Texas too, and um, you know, even throughout the game, I mean, I'm hearing them chant Reggie, Reggie. It's like, where are, where are we playing? Are we playing in New Orleans or are we playing in Dallas? So that was pretty cool. For those Saints fans who couldn't enjoy the game in person but shared vicariously in the excitement from New Orleans, there was one last opportunity to personally convey their joy. As the Saints deplaned last night in the wee hours of the morning, they did so to the cheers of the Houdats who lined the road leading from the airport. You would think that 3 a.m. everybody would be, you know, sound asleep, but uh, the fans were out and they were excited. I mean, they were pumped up and that's a great way to come home after a big win like that. You know, they've been very supportive. You know, we come back after these noon games and there are people out there. And, and uh, you know, I thought when we were flying, I thought surely at 2.30 in the morning there's not going to be uh, anyone out there. And when the plane landed, you know, it seemed like there were more people out there. So I don't know how much work's getting done today. <laughs> Our mailbox at WWLTV.com has been flooded with questions about the Saints and their big win, and we'll try and answer a couple of them now. This first viewer asked, what is the Saints' biggest weakness right now, and can they correct it? Well, a few weeks ago, you would have said they've got to stop turning the ball over. They have. They haven't had a turnover in the last three games, and they've won them all. 
About that time, you would have said they've got to start creating turnovers. They've had five interceptions in the last two games, each of which they have won. So probably just based on last night, the biggest deficiency the Saints have right now is uh, covering kickoffs, and that's certainly something that's very correctable. Another viewer asked, what do you think the chances are of a letdown after such a big win? Well, after they had won their first three games of the season, and of course they had that big victory against Atlanta, they came off of that with a loss against the Panthers, and you could probably say they had a bit of a letdown there. Then after they played the Falcons three weeks ago, maybe you would have expected a letdown against the 49ers, and they came back with one of their very best efforts of the entire season. So will there be a letdown emotionally uh, against the Redskins? Probably so, it would probably be natural, but can the Saints win despite such a letdown? I would think that they can. Earlier we heard Sean Payton break down last night's game and today Cowboys coach Bill Parcells talked after he had time to digest his team's ugly showing against the Saints. Well I don't think we're really as bad as what, what happened the other night uh, there and I give them credit they they had a good plan they executed it but we gave them a lot of help. And uh, both mentally we made mistakes and, and then we were in position to make several plays that we didn't make that wound up in big, resulting in big games and a couple of them touchdowns. So uh, as I said, I give them credit because they executed certainly far superior to what we did. But I, I felt like mentally, I mean at least emotionally, I know we were prepared for the game. and. Uh, they just took it away from us. I want to take some of your questions right now over the phone. And Mike and Luling, I understand you're on our, uh, our call. Uh, what do you want to talk about? I understand it might be about effect the effectiveness of Gary Gibbs as the Saints defensive coordinator. Yeah, Jim, thank you for, uh, for asking. I tell you, I wanted to bring it up. We, we don't have a lot of surprises on offense, I think, aside from Marcus Colston. What a great job everybody's doing. But I think, personally, the biggest surprise we got is our defense. And I'm just wondering why you guys in the media don't give Coach Gibbs more recognition. I think he's doing a fantastic job. I think that's probably the biggest surprise we see this year. Well, that's a pretty good point. I would say probably they don't give him enough credit on defense because the offense has been so overwhelming, and that's where everybody's attention has been. I think the Saints have the opportunity to outscore just about anybody that they play in the NFL, and if they do continue to play better defense as they have recently, and uh, if the secondary can continue to be as aggressive as it is and create turnovers, I think Gary Gibbs probably will get the credit that he so richly deserves. I thank you, Mike, very much for your call. Chris and Gentilly, you've got a question about will Breeze be like a Montana for the Saints? Something along those lines? Yeah, and I want to ask you, I want to ask you, do you believe the Saints will go to the Super Bowl this year? I think they're capable of going to the Super Bowl. I mean, teams with a lot worse offenses than the Saints have gone to the Super Bowl and won it. Uh, your question, I think, also included about the fact about Joe Montana or the, the likelihood that Drew Brees could be com compared to a Joe Montana. And I think that's a very apt comparison. Uh, you know, Joe Montana never had the great measurables. He never had the strong arm. He never had the size. He never had the speed. He never had... Um, all those things that so many times people look for in a quarterback, the arm strength. But what he did have is an ability to pre-read defenses and to throw accurately. And if you look at Drew Brees, I think those are his two best attributes. He knows where he wants to go with the football. He makes great decisions in the pocket. And he also is extremely accurate. If you look at the way Drew Brees has been throwing the football, look at how many times the receivers are hit in stride and how seldom that used to happen in the past. Thanks for your call. On the other side of the break, we'll take more of your calls about the Saints, and we'll head to Tulane, where the Green Wave have found their new head football coach. And welcome back. We'll be taking more of your some of our viewers' thoughts on the Saints. Mike from Homa, you're holding on about the Saints getting some national respect. Yeah, man, you you would have thought that uh, after beating Philadelphia um, right before the bye week, we would have gained respect there. Do you think after blowing out Dallas last night, we're going to quiet, quiet the critics down? I think they'll quiet some of them. I think when the, the critics looked at the Saints' record, they saw those three losses to teams from the AFC North, and the AFC does look to, be, look to be a lot better than the NFC this year, and they said, well, the Saints' record has really been founded against the lesser lights of the NFC. 
but the Cowboys truly are, in the minds of many critics, America's team. They were playing so well, they had so much hype behind them, and for the Saints to go in there last night and dismantle them as thoroughly as they did, I definitely think a lot of the critics will uh, be quieted by that, and I think you'll hear a lot of good words said about the Saints throughout this coming week. Freddie from Kenner, you're on the line. Freddie? How you doing, Jim? Um, my question is, uh, in the past we've made the playoffs and we were one and done. Do you think that will happen again this year? And if not, who do you think could, you know, would stand a chance of beating the Saints in the playoffs? Personally, I don't think anybody. I think we're Miami bound. <laughs> Well, that'd be great. I think the chances for the Saints to advance in the playoffs, and of course they've only had the one playoff victory against the Rams in 2000, are greater now than ever before, and it's because of this offense. I think the Saints' offense, which truly has not been stopped by anybody all year long, can outscore a lot of teams, even if the Saints have a bad day defensively and teams come in here with some offensive firepower. Uh, Juan, I know you're out of Tulane. What do you think about that? Well, Jim, I think that uh, Ella, I think the Saints have a pretty good chance of getting past anyone in this NFC uh, bracket. I think the big key here is that the Saints haven't shown this year they can't beat anybody in the NFC. You look at Dallas, they have the tiebreaker against them now. Obviously have it against Philadelphia, have it against Atlanta if those teams make the playoffs. So I would like to see the Saints team get into playoffs and not only host one game, but if things slip up with Chicago tonight, maybe the Saints get that home field advantage, which we know it's very difficult playing in the Superdome. That's a good point. Kim from Metairie, you're on the line as well. Kim, are you there? Yes, I am. What you got on your mind tonight, Kim? I've got a question about the penalties yesterday. Um, they had a penalty about uh, taunting. How many times have they thrown a flag on taunting? And also, Dallas had thrown a challenge flag within the, the two minutes. And they got penalized with a unsportsmanlike comment, yeah, you know, co conduct. And I'm wondering how come they didn't have a a uh, timeout taken away from them. <laughs> Well, okay, first of all on the taunting thing. This was something that the NFL officials told us in preseason that they were going to enforce a great deal more uh, than I've seen it enforced during the regular season. I remember the call during preseason, I think it was Pac-Man Jones of the Titans when the Saints played them, but I, don't, I can't really recall it being called all year long until last night. And I think that officiating crew last night didn't have a very good night in a lot of ways. And I also think they know it's on national television as well, so they're going to show all their superiors that they know the rules as well. So they throw that taunting uh, flag on Mike McKenzie. But it wasn't a very smart move on his part either. Um, the flag that came against uh, Bill Parcells, and this I thought was really interesting. I, th I think it showed to me that Sean Payton was far more into the game than Bill Parcells was because from what I understand from Kenny Wilkerson who was down on the sideline, it was really the Saints who initiated getting the call on Bill Parcells for throwing that flag. During the final two minutes of the half, during the final two minutes of the game, that's been called from upstairs. The officials upstairs, the replay official, takes charge of that call. So when Parcells threw the flag within that final two minutes, not only did he not recognize that this had to come from up above, he probably didn't even recognize that it was uh, an unsportsmanlike conduct call for doing so because that's another thing that I haven't seen all year long. In fact, I've never seen since they went to this system of instant replay and challenges. So it was an interesting night. Um, we have another caller. Ed from Algiers. Ed, are you there? Are you there, Ed? No, nah, my name is Jerome. All right. Ed, you can change your name and still be on the broadcast. What you got on your mind, Jerome? Um, uh, I would just want to say, uh, what, are, what, what do you think the chances are of um, Drew Brees uh, breaking Dan Marino's all-time passing record? I think they're pretty good. Um, you know, the Saints are probably going to get a little bit healthier. Joe Horn's going to come back. They may be in some games where they'll have to throw the ball even more than they have recently. Um, you know, when they went through that stretch, when they really were a one-sided team offensively, I'm thinking back to that Bengals game, that's where he really put up some huge numbers, over 500 yards. And I don't think the Saints want to go back to that. But, you know, you almost take a 300-yard game 
by Drew Brees for granted now because he's done it so often. Juan, would you agree? Well, Jim, I talked to Drew Brees in the locker room today, and I asked him off camera, I said, Drew, do you have any idea what the passing record in, for a single season is? He threw his hands up as if saying, I don't want to talk about it. I said, just off the cuff. He's like, and he threw the number out exactly. So he is well aware of how far he has to go to break that record. You know, players know when they're closing in on a record in the NFL. Danian Tomlinson knew it when he got the rushing re touchdown record in a single season over the weekend. Drew Brees knows where he stands. And Jimmy has so many options to score touchdowns on this team. I would find it hard to believe that he would not break some records before this year is up. Including Reggie Bush, who's just a, such a great target coming out of the backfield and has already broken the Saints record for uh, catches by a running back. Bridget from Gentilly. Bridget, I think you're going to be our last caller. You there, Bridget? Yes. What you got on your mind tonight? I'm looking into the future. All right. A season ticket holder. Okay. Uh, season ticket holder. I'm looking into the future. All right. What are the advan uh, advantages that we have as season ticket holders for getting tickets to the Super Bowl? 733-0255. 733-0255. That's the same number, and they can probably address it a lot more thoroughly than I have the knowledge to. Well, that's going to do it for us tonight. For all of us who make this show possible, we thank you so much for being with us, and we'll have more on Tulane's new head coach tonight on Nightwatch. Thank you. Back at